Okay, welcome back. Uh, we will continue with the session, and uh, now we have uh, Satadru Prasajaria, again from uh, ISRO. Okay, so good morning to all, and uh, thanks uh, to ICTS and SPO for providing me this opportunity to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, the lunar uh, mineral mapping and the volatiles, uh, with special reference to the uh, lunar poles. So. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a paucity of time, so I would like to skip many of the slides, uh, which are of general nature, and we'll be talking mostly focusing on the results uh, obtained uh, in the recent past uh, using uh, the Chandrayaan-1 and uh, LRO and other missions. And uh, in a um, uh, review paper, Professor Carly Peters summarized this whole uh, lunar exploration and research the last 50 odd years uh, in three basic phases basically. And the first phase is of uh, first insight phase, which is basically the era of Apollo and Luna, followed by uh, long hiatus uh, until there is a reawakening phase of, uh, started with the Clementine missions, followed by the lunar prospector missions. And then we have this um, Selin, Kaguya, then Chandrayaan-1, and subsequently, uh, uh, long-standing presence, which will be in due course of time happening through Artemis and so on and so forth. And in all these things, uh, there was a huge uh, changes happened in the way we used to understand the moon. And uh, first and foremost of them is that uh, during the Apollo era and post-Apollo era, the understanding was that moon is bone dry. And that happened primarily because of uh, the absence of a particular mineral in the sample written collections, which is called amphibole. Now, amphibole is basically a major rock forming silicate, which is uh, allowing volatiles to reside inside its crystal lattice uh, in terms of OH or H2O. Uh, amphibole is uh, quite abundant in case of Earth, but uh, when uh, lunar uh, geologists and the scientists uh, couldn't find the traces of amphibole in uh, the written samples, they thought that uh, the magma which has generated the lunar crust and the mantles must be extremely anhydrous. So with that uh, notion, uh, people started thinking that uh, moon must be uh, extremely dry. Skip few of the slides. Of course, uh, there are many hypotheses behind the formation of moon, but the most favored one is the giant impact hypothesis, uh, which also uh, uh, tells us uh, why there is a commonality between the compositions in particular, the oxygen isotopic compositions of uh, the Earth and the Moon. And also, it explains uh, the higher angular moon momentum of uh, the Earth Moon system. So, today, uh, this uh, giant impact hypothesis is uh, the most favored uh, hypothesis uh, behind the origin of Moon. And it also tells that because of such a giant impact, uh, the most uh, volatile element, that is hydrogen, must have completely lost. But in due course of time, we'll see that uh, how uh, that understanding has changed. So what has happened is that uh, during uh, the early phase, uh, there was a proto-planet, uh, proto-Earth, uh, proto and then it collided with a Mars-sized object. And uh, most of the part of uh, Earth's uh, then mantle went up and then uh, accretion started. And because of the accretional heating, there was a global magma ocean generated. And then uh, when the magma ocean started cooling down, there is a segregation happened in terms of uh, the lunar crust and also into mantle and core. And if we specifically talk about the lunar crust, there is a canonical uh, compositional stratigraphy developed. So there is a, on the top, there is a very lighter uh, materials called plagioclase, which floated on a deeper uh, and uh, denser magma, which is dominated by the FEMG rich materials, minerals. And that is how the cross uh, highland uh, compositions uh, came into the picture. Subsequent to that, there was a late heavy bombardment period and uh, uh, that caused a deep puncturing into the lunar crust and sudden decompression released magma melt. And that filled the lower depressions, large basins uh, following the secondary crust. We used to call them as mare, which are basically resulting com in compositions. So if we talk about the uh, uh, Apollo missions, uh, so we uh, understand that moon is an evolved terrestrial planet, uh, not a primordial object. It is basically differentiated in terms of the crust mantle core. 
it preserves the early solar system history. So it is basically a natural laboratory if we want to study the early uh, part of the solar system histories and particularly the late heavy bombardment periods. And it is also genetically re re related because the return samples which were brought to the uh, Earth, uh, they are uh, oxygen isotopic compositions uh, perfectly matches with that of the uh, lunar uh, samples. And therefore, it basically sits on the terrestrial fractionation lines, if we draw. And all moon rocks are generated from high temperature processes, having little or no involvement with water. That was one of the important uh, inferences uh, coming out of this. Uh, lunar uh, Apollo and lunar missions. However, uh, there uh, were certain uh, uh, findings about uh, the minerals, uh, which are basically hydrous in nature called acagenite. But uh, all these uh, kind of minerals in the uh, Apollo return sample collections were thought to be of terrestrial uh, contaminations. So later on, all those propositions were uh, basically um, rejected. Then, of course, uh, the solar wind implanted uh, proton based hydroxylations is very common process on, in case of uh, moon, and uh, it uh, shows this kind of agl agglutinate formations. Uh, this is basically uh, uh, the microbiotic bombardments and cosmic ray eatings. They impinge into the lunar surface, producing a, a highly reducing environment and spelling of the oxygens from the mineral silicates. And that oxygen actually works, uh, reacts with the hydrogen to produce the waters. And this kind of agglutinates form are also resulted in the formation of the nanophase iron particle particles as a vapor deposited coatings. But then uh, during this reawakening phase, uh, start, uh, some interesting results started coming. And one of the most crucial one is the, you know, that of the Clementine uh, biostatic radar experiments. And using the uh, circular polarization ratio techniques, uh, they found uh, uh, very high uh, CPR values which can only be corroborated with uh, surface uh, kind of uh, regolith ice mixtures or ice deposits basically. So that was the starting point when uh, people started thinking in a different way that no, whatever we were thinking earlier that moon is moon rise, that may not be the case. So it is way back in uh, 1994 after the launch of the Clementine uh, when by study radar, radar experiments uh, came up with this kind of results. Followed by of course uh, this uh, uh, this uh, lunar prospector neutron spectrometer, which identified a huge amount of um, uh, excess hydrogen in both the lunar poles. That also talked about uh, the presence of uh, uh, volatile uh, hydrogens in maybe uh, implanted in the regolith and a very cold, as a cold traps because all these uh, ESRs are acting as cold traps where this kind of uh, volatiles can be easily trapped. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, the Chandrayaan-1 was launched or Kagu Kaguya-Selin was launched, almost uh, contemporary to that particular time frame, all these lunar return samples were revisited with some sophisticated uh, instruments called nano seams, seams in various heart-based labs. And they started uh, finding the traces of water in different kind of uh, environments. But they are also uh, associated with the lunar volcanic glasses. And one such uh, example is from Saal et al. And they did uh, seams uh, measurements for these orange and uh, uh, orange and green glasses from Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 return samples. And as you can see, you can, uh, the H2O in uh, 20 to 40 ppm's they have detected. And also, they uh, tried to uh, corroborate the D, D by H ratios and also the nitrogen isotopic compositions. Uh, to see the parentage of this kind of uh, uh, waters. And they found that it is matching with the carbonaceous chondrite kind of uh, reservoir. And then uh, came the Chandrayaan-1 uh, mission in 2008. And it is, of course, a game changer, I would say. And uh, two of the most crucial discoveries that came from this particular mission is that of uh, the detection of the widespread hydration, uh, of course, at the lunar higher latitudes and followed by uh, the discovery of a new rock type uh, called spinel bearing uh, lithologies on the lunar surface. So the mission, when uh, it was planned, uh, the main idea was to uh, carry out simultaneous mineralogical, chemical, and photogeological mapping at resolutions better than the previous and currently planned lunar missions. That was the goal. And also uh, there was another objective, science objective, to uh, test the hypothesis of uh, the presence of uh, magma ocean. 
So if uh, there is a magma ocean and if there is a, uh, a plagioclase uh, rich uh, crust, which is formed from the flotation of the plagioclase, then there has to have some kind of signatures of this crystalline plagioclase. And this kind of, uh, uh, there are instrument suits uh, which were uh, uh, built in such a manner that uh, this kind of mineralogies can be very easily detected. So uh, Chandrayaan-1 had three imaging, uh, two imaging spectrometers and one non-imaging uh, spectrometer. Uh, one of them is the JPL NASA instrument called Moon Mineralogy Mapper, which was spanning from 0.4 to uh, three micrometer. Whereas there was a, another instrument which was built at Space Application Center Ahmedabad uh, by ISRO. And that was from 450 nanometer to uh, around 960 nanometer. And there was another instrument from Max Planck Institute, uh, Germany, uh, which is SAR2 instrument, which is operating from 900 to 2400 nanometer, but it is basically a point spectrometer. So together all this, uh, particularly in particular, um, uh, M-cube or moon mineralogy mapper uh, came out with uh, fascinating discoveries about the detection of water and that is widespread hydrations. So uh, in 2009, September, there was a series of paper came and uh, of course one is uh, using the Chandrayaan-1 moon mineralogy mapper. What you can see over here is the three micrometer absorption bands and if you see in the top uh, left, uh, top right uh, corner, it is the uh, absorption features of OH, H2O and uh, water ice. And uh, M cube stops at around 3000 nanometer or three micrometer. Therefore it is not able to completely characterize the water feature. But what they could see, if we generate a band, uh, integrated band depth with respect to these absorptions due to the hydroxyls and water um, uh, stretchings, asymmetric and asymmetric stretchings, then you can get a higher uh, kind of uh, bright, brighter pictures at three by micrometer absorption band depth. And that is uh, related to the presence of uh, the hydroxyl soil and or water. But of course, since M cube stops at around three micrometer, it cannot differentiate whether it is only hydroxyl or um, uh, what do you call water. But then uh, M cube team also requested uh, two uh, other uh, science team members to look into their data sets while they were traveling and flying by the moon. One is the uh, Cassini uh, visible infrared uh, mapping spectrometer. And the other one is uh, basically deep impact epoxy missions. So uh, when uh, they were requested, they looked into their uh, data. Uh, Cassini beams as well as uh, deep epoxy uh, high resolution imaging spectrometer, they both looked at the moon while flying by for the lunar calibration purpose. And they could also see the presence of a three micrometer prominent feature uh, which is uh, related to the presence of uh, OH and water. And interestingly, they also obtained the data in different uh, 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 time of the day, and they could capture the uh, time of the day dependent uh, variations in the strength of the water hydration features. That means it is basically loosely bound adsorbed materials. And when the surface temperature increases, uh, the absorption band depth decreases, that means it is a uh, loss of water is happening. And also there is a, uh, if we talk about from the night side to the uh, sunlit side, there is a, even the, from equator to the uh, polar areas or high latitude areas, there is a ballistic jump of the volatiles that is also recorded. Of course, if you see this, uh, the larger one, uh, and uh, there are different kinds of band ratioing techniques or integrated band depth based analysis, which in a uh, nutshell can tell you about the uh, presence of hydrations as well as the mineralogical variations within the lunar crust. So this is such a, uh, uh, a false color composite, I would say. And in this, this blue color indicates the three micron absorption band depth. So the more blue, bluer it is, the strength of the absorption feature is increasing. It is basically a qualitative way to see uh, the nature of the absorptions. And of course, this red indicates the absorptions due to the presence of Fe2 plus in the crystal lattice of various mafic silicates or pyroxenes, minerals like pyroxenes, olivines. They used to show up in an absorption feature around two micrometer. And if we do an integrated band depth analysis of the two micrometer, and we can put it in a red color. So all these red stuffs highlight the presence of these mafic silicates on the lunar surface. So uh, this particular uh, uh, figure, actually the image shows uh, the presence of uh, hydrations in the higher latitudes and also the very mineralogical variations across the lunar surface and green is being the uh, highland compositions, which is basically a featureless spectra of plagioclase feldspar. 
So uh, as you can see here, uh, in case of uh, DP proc, uh, DP proxy, proxy had two cords uh, going through the lunar uh, north polar regions. And if we do a continuum removal of the absorption spectra with a linear continuum from the shoulders of the shorter wavelength absorptions to the longer wavelength, then you can get on, uh, the, only the prominent absorption features. And if you look at uh, carefully, uh, there are uh, some dashed lines and they corroborate with a 2.81 2.95 and 3.14 micrometers. And this particular uh, spectra is extremely important. It tells you that not only OH is present, but is also uh, the presence of um, uh, H2O is there because this 3.14 is basically the overtone of the primary uh, fundamental absorption, so, which is arising at six micrometer. Very recently, there is an instrument, a SOFIA instrument. They came up with uh, some interesting results. And of course, uh, they came up with the South Polar maps also. They have this uh, six micrometer channel, uh, the complete channel, and that is the HOH bending fundamental absorption zone. And it unambiguously detects the presence of uh, water on the lunar surface. I may not be having the slides for that. Okay, so I can skip because this is the old uh, results only, but uh, they refined it, uh, the hydrogen abundances from the lunar perspective data, but they corrected for the effects of REs because there are two particular REs uh, which are of absorbing natures. And because of that, you need to uh, uh, take into considerations of the uh, RE based corrections. And after uh, modifying them, they uh, came up with this hydrogen map, the global hydrogen map of the lunar surface. Okay, now when we are talking about the widespread hydrations on the moon, uh, there are, uh, since 2017, I would say that uh, there are huge number of papers coming every now and then. And uh, then there is uh, one interesting results came from uh, this Banfield and his team. They uh, came up with a different kind of a thermal uh, correction scheme where they introduced the roughness parameters uh, and using the roughness parameters, they corrected for the thermal uh, perturbations. If you see, in case of lunar spectra, if you go beyond two micrometer because of the thermally emitted component, you will see that there is an increase in the uh, spectral feature, in the longer wavelength. But if you uh, correct for the thermal effect, then the spectra should look like this. Not only that, they also uh, try to uh, uh, quantify, uh, they have also seen that irrespective of the latitude and long longitude, and also the time of the day, uh, these uh, features, these OH H2O features in the uh, around three micrometer regions doesn't change. Whereas uh, M cube as well as beams data uh, and uh, Jessica Sunshine and uh, Tim uh, has seen in case of deep impact that there is a diurnal variability as well as the latitudinal dependence as also the dependence of uh, the water retention as a function of the surface compositions. Again, another study with a different, again, a different kind of schemes of uh, correcting for the thermal effects. It is a thermal equilibrium based Skunathov's model. Using that, uh, Uller and uh, the team came up with a global OH IVD maps. So they tried to map the strength of the integrated band depth uh, arising due to the presence of OH. So that is also another interesting result scheme. Another one is by Lee and Milliken. They tried to come up with a semi-empirical kind of uh, algorithm. And uh, using that, uh, they could uh, map the complete uh, uh, moon with uh, respect to the SPAT parameters. Uh, if we convert these uh, reflectance spectras into the single scattering albedo domain, then uh, the, uh, it, is, it shows a linear relationships between the presence of water and the uh, single uh, scattering albedo. So it is very easy to quantify. So SPAT is basically effective single particle absorption thickness. So using that parameter, one can quantify the presence of water in that. So, but this one is really interesting. This is a, again a very recent study where uh, Ben Nital had uh, shown and co correlated the fluxes in neutral mass spectrometers on board LADI with the micro, uh, with the meteor, uh, meteoroid uh, streams. Okay, so there are 29 uh, meteoroid streams identified here. And uh, corresponding to those streams, they have found uh, this fluxes in, increase in the uh, atomic mass unit 18. Uh, 
uh, which is related to the presence of water in the lunar exosphere. And uh, then they gave a very nice uh, cartoon to uh, uh, present this uh, water cycle. They uh, present the actual uh, active water cycles on the lunar surface. They came up with a uh, topmost desiccated surface of few centimeters, followed by a hydra hydrated soil regime of few meters. And uh, because of this, uh, uh, and then you have the continuous solar induced, uh, solar proton induced hydroxylations is happening. And then the loss is happening whenever there is a micro, uh, uh, micro meteorite bombardment events, uh, meteorite, uh, meteoric impacts, then the loss of water is happening. Some uh, replenishments are happening through this uh, uh, hydrated soil layer underneath, and it is coming in the top. And again, through another event, it will go up. And they tried to uh, come up with the uh, uh, estimate of uh, how much uh, loss is happening and uh, how much uh, formations uh, through the solar uh, wind induced photohydroxylations is happening. So let um, another interesting is of course from MCUBE, uh, Shuaili and Milliken and uh, their team, they tried to um, uh, see whether there is really water ice present on the lunar surface, at least at the poles. So what they did is that they looked into the PSRs. These are all permanently shadowed regions, which is having a temperature of the order of 60 to 120 Kelvin at the most. And then uh, by multiplying different uh, images of uh, M cube on the same areas, they tried to improve the signal to noise ratio and they could find the signatures of uh, water ice. This is the pure ice signatures. And these are from different craters, which shows the presence of uh, water ice in them. And they could map these water ice bearing locations in the lunar poles, both the poles. And this is a very interesting uh, results. Uh, so uh, we are talking about the lunar mineralogies and uh, I talked about the presence of a canonical stratigraphy. This particular area is called South Pole Atkan Basin. This is the largest basin in the uh, solar system. It's around 2,500 kilometer dia. And, uh, in fact, if we see the grail-based crustal thickness map, then almost the mantle is exposed over here. And that's why you will see a lot of um, uh, iron magnesium rich minerals. And uh, using M-cube, uh, Moriarty and his team uh, nicely mapped these uh, different kinds of variations in the uh, band depth of one micrometer and two micrometer features, which, re which are related to the chemical compositional differences of different kinds of pyroxenes, olivines, on and so forth. This is one interesting results. Uh, this is similar kind of results with spectral profiler data from Kaguya Selin uh, and uh, Lemelin et al. Uh, mapped the FEO contents uh, using the Selin data and also the plagioclase uh, percents and olivine percents. Okay. And uh, then I would like to show some results from the Chandrayaan 2 IARS instruments. And as you can see, when uh, Chandrayaan 2 was orbiting, uh, I mean, approaching its final orbit from a, quite a distance, it, is, it, uh, it took the picture of the part of the northern hemispheres, including the lunar po uh, north polar regions. And uh, we could see the presence of uh, hydration features over here. And we could try to map the band center values of the different hydrations. And uh, we have seen the, uh, I'll show some spectra. I think I'm having, yeah. So you can see the different kind of spectra of the hydration features and we could completely characterize the three micrometer feature using the IRS data. And as you can see, there are differences in the uh, shape of the band absorptions, uh, which tells us about the presence of whether it is OH or H2O, so on and so forth. And this will be the last results. This is called uh, Shackleton Crater Rim and uh, the uh, De Gardelecha uh, Ridge, connecting ridge. And this is one of the important sites identified for Artemis as well as uh, Lupex and other future missions. And uh, we have obtained the spectra from IRS for different regions, sunlit portions, and it shows the presence of hydrations. We have tried to estimate also using the SPAT parameters. And as you can see, it is around varying from 100 to 1000 PPMs over here. So I will stop here and would be happy to answer some questions. At all. Thank you, Shadaldu. 
we have some time for questions. Thank you. Uh, would you give us an idea of what's the density of this water moisture in the uh, deep subsurface structure? Deep subsurface. Like, uh, you said on the surface, See, it, it it's is only, percolating upwards. Yeah. During okay, the so that was the model given by uh, this uh, Ladi team based yeah. on their uh, this neutron, uh, neutral mass spectrometer detections. Uh, there, but if you see the hydrogen uh, maps generated from the lunar prospector data, is of the order of few meters depth it is coming. Whereas when we are talking about the IR spectrometers, so it is basically the absolute the one one to two millimeter of the top surface. Uh, but uh, there is an active process in case of moon, which is called impact gardening. So, so much of impact is happening. So there is a complete churn up. And uh, in the deeper parts also, that's why there is always a hydrated soil present, at least in the higher latitudes. Okay. So I can't, I won't be able to tell you right now the exact densities and all. I suppose it varies across from the equatorial. Of course, it will vary. It will vary. Definitely, because from even from mid latitude to the uh, high latitude, also if you go, because of the stabilities and retention capabilities with respect to different kind of compositions for the surface compositions, also that has to be taken into consideration. Yeah. Like we have these highland plagioclase-rich materials and basalts, mare basalts, and the retention cap capabilities of plagioclase or OH or H2 is more as compared to the basalts. So that is also uh, there. I have a sorry. sorry. Yes. Uh, you mentioned impacts. Yeah. Is there an idea of how often moon is impacted by meteoroids of a certain size? Uh, it is, uh, I mean, hairless body, and it is, uh, I mean, uh, even now also it is micrometeoritic uh, impacts are happening, uh, or it is continuously interacting with the solar winds and cosmic rays. So, but when that we is, go through uh, a meteoroid swarm or something. Yeah, so that's what uh, they also showed uh, that uh, the known meteoritic streams when it is coming, okay, it is interacting. And then you find really see the peaks in the uh, concentrations of water in the exosphere because of that. Okay. Uh, let me mention why I asked that. Yeah. Because uh, when we try to model the uh, shear modulus of the moon as such, okay. it would I would imagine that one would one would do it with let's say three or four seismometers on the moon in different mm -hmm. locations, mm -hmm. and then you would use one of the meteorite strikes as an excitation mm -hmm. of the moon. And then you can work out how the interior of the moon is, just oh. like we do it on Earth. Okay. When there is an earthquake, mm -hmm. we observe it with seismometers, and then we deduce what's yeah. inside. Perhaps you, I mean, you can plan, I mean, something like this insight uh, on Mars. So if you have some kind of, or passive seismometer, basically. So once there is a, but it again depends on the sensitivity level of that instrument itself, that what magnitude of uh, meteorite fluxes it can detect. Yes. Right. Yes, I, I can also mention that there's a, a little bit of help from the science community because there are also proposals for satellite missions to observe the flashes in EM produced by meteoroid impacts. And so that gives you a timing and location, and that makes it far more accurate to use it for any analysis of the geology and internal structure. Yeah. Uh, well, for soundcheck, that would be very interesting. So yeah, with soundcheck, we are actually already in contact with, so there's one uh, mission I know is called Lumio with, because it has Italian involvement. Uh, I don't know if there are other proposals, but the, with them, we're already in contact to see about the uh, timelines might even line up. But anyway, it's, uh, yeah, we, we need it together, at, of course, at the same time. Hi, um, I have a question on the distribution of the ice. So you mentioned that there's two observation um, have, which has different sensitivity to depths. With that, do you can you estimate the 1D um, distribution of the ice if it's like focusing on the surface or if it's um, homogeneously distributed within a couple of meters? Do you have any idea on this? Um, whatever isolated studies have happened, uh, of course, it is mostly uh, one study only through these imaging spectrometers like this MQ. But of course, it is only uh, sensing the uh, top skin basically. Okay, so you don't get the uh, details. But I believe that uh, there will be a uh, uh, next uh, presentation by Sriram, Dr. Sriram. He'll be talking about the SAR based uh, water ice detections on the lunar surface. And I think he may be able to give you the real estimates. Uh, 
So in the subsurface, how it is distributed and what is the quantity? Okay, I'll wait another 30 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Thank uh, you. Uh, once again, and we'll continue.